Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk. Today's topic is planning and configuring your chart of accounts, part two, financial dimensions. My name is Peggy and I'll be your moderator today. We're broadcasting this session through Teams Live events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. This session is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. When you join this event, your name, email address, and or phone number may be viewable by other session participants in the attendee list. By joining, you're agreeing to this experience. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions during today's presentation, and there'll be time at the end for any further questions. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Rachel Prophet, Senior Fast Track Solution Architect, and Eric Pegers, Senior Solution Architect. Rachel, over to you. Thanks, Peggy, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we've got some dedicated folks out there wanting to learn everything that you never wanted to know about financial dimensions on a Friday. So thank you, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you might be joining from. Again, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel Prophet. I am a senior fast track solution architect based out of Denver. And my contact information is here on the screen. I invite you to give me a follow on Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn, check out my new YouTube channel, Dynamics 365 Unboxed, or check out my blog at dynamics365lady.com. Also joining us today, we have Eric. Eric, do you want to do a quick introduction? Yes, thanks, Rachel. My name is Eric Pigors, and I'm also a senior fast track solution architect uh, based out of Fargo and my contact info is on the screen. Thank you. Awesome. So taking a quick look at the objectives for today's Tech Talk, uh, we're going to be starting out by describing how to plan your financial dimensions. Uh, we're also going to talk about a variety of recommended practices for configuring your financial dimensions. Uh, we also hope that you take away from this an understanding of how the defaulting behavior for your financial dimensions work. And we have a number of demonstrations lined up to show you how to configure dimensions and all of their related options. Um, and we're also going to discuss and show you how to create financial dimension sets. Some things we won't be covering in today's session are main accounts. If you missed out on part one, uh, that recording should be available very soon on the Tech Talk Community Dynamics page. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. That's where we dove into main accounts. And in our upcoming parts, we'll be covering account structures, advanced rules, the ledger, and your calendar configuration. So if those topics are of interest to you, make sure you get registered for those upcoming parts in our series, which are happening over the next two weeks. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Eric, who is going to deep dive into financial dimensions for us. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, there are two types of financial dimensions. The first is custom dimensions. These dimensions are manually created and maintained, typically by a controller or another role on the finance team. One advantage to this type of dimension is they allow flexibility for any type of values you want to create. Example of a custom dimension might include things like brand, expense purpose, location, and so on. Next are system-defined dimensions. These are special types of dimensions where the values come from another source or entity in the system. When we think about system-defined dimensions, there are two types of entities that can be used. First are dimensions that are backed by existing data. Examples of this might include things like customer, customer group, item, item group, and so on. When working with a dimension that is backed by existing data, the big advantage is that the data is sourced from the same data, that the dimension is sourced from the same data. So by maintaining the item groups, for example, the system will automatically maintain the related financial dimensions. 
These types of dimensions also support the ability to default a value onto the corresponding record. For example, if you have a customer financial dimension, the system can create the customer financial dimension and then link that dimension value to the customer itself automatically. It is important to note that some values or tables that you select for financial dimensions are legal entity specific, while others are global. For example, item numbers and item groups are legal entity specific. Therefore, the list of values that will be available in each legal entity is specific to the values set up in that same legal entity, while other entities are global. One example of a global entity is the worker entity. Some of the options in the Use Values From drop-down box are operating units. This includes cost center, department, business unit, retail channel, and so on. These values are global as well. However, it is important to note that only these dimensions can be added to an organizational hierarchy. If you plan to include the relationship of departments to business units, for example, in your account structure, this can only be achieved with a financial dimension that is backed by an operating unit. The list of values that you can choose from for financial dimensions in the Use Values From drop-down box is a fixed list of more than 30 entities. If an additional entity is required to be a financial dimension, you can create an extension to enable financial dimensions for any table in the system, including a custom table. <laughs> when we think about the settings on financial dimensions, we have broken them down into three categories. First are the settings specific to custom dimensions, Next are settings specific to system-defined dimensions, and last are the settings that are common for all financial dimensions. Let's start by taking a closer look at custom dimensions. When you use a custom dimension, you will need to manually create the values for the dimension. You will need to manually create the values in the financial dimension values page. We recommend that you consider defining a mask on the financial dimension to control the format of the numbers for the values. For example, if you want a three-digit value, you will enter three pound signs in the mask. When you use a system-defined dimension or a dimension that is backed by an entity, the values cannot be created or edited on the financial dimension values page directly. Instead, you go to the page that is used to maintain the source data. For example, if you have a financial dimension for customer groups, you will create and maintain the dimension values by creating or editing the customer groups directly on the customer groups page. For a dimension that is backed by an entity or another source, you can optionally select the checkbox to copy the values to that source record. This option, however, is not available for all entity back dimensions. An example where you can copy the value is customers. So when you create a new customer, the customer financial dimension is automatically created and linked to the customer on the financial dimensions fast tab. There are also several common settings that you will find on any financial dimension. This includes the ability to name the dimension and to define a report column name. You can also select to require the dimension to be balanced, meaning that debits and credits for each entry must be balanced for the selected financial dimension. This checkbox is typically used by public sector organizations and requires that you configure posting definitions to define the offset account for the interunit debits and credits. You can also create translations for the financial dimensions as well. Last, there is, last is the ability to create a derived dimension. A 
Derived dimensions allow you to create a conversion of one value string to a different value string. It is important to note that the, that the derived dimensions feature is only available for entity-backed financial dimensions that are global. For example, projects are legal entity specific, so you cannot define a derived dimension for this type of dimension. Once you have defined the financial dimensions, you can start to define the values for the dimensions, keeping in mind that you cannot create or edit the values for any entity back dimension directly in the financial dimension values page. You can update the settings on the values that are created in the source. When you work with the financial, when you work with financial dimension values, you can specify active from and to dates which control when you can post transactions into the general ledger with the selected values. You can think of this as a mechanism to dynamically control the suspension or activation of the dimension value, while the suspend checkbox is used to control access to the dimension globally. The do not allow manual entry checkbox is used to indicate whether you want to allow users to select the dimension value in a journal entry. When this option is selected, you can still specify the value on master data and use it in source documents, such as sales orders and purchase orders. However, you cannot manually select the value in a journal, such as a payment journal or invoice journal. You can use the, you can use the owner field to link a dimension value to a worker in your organization. This can be useful when you use workflows as a dynamic way to assign a work item to a specific user based on the worker selected on the dimension value that is linked to the related source document. The group dimension field is used to create a translation, and I use the term translation loosely. This is typically used when you consolidate your financials and you need to group or translate the detailed values, the detailed values to another value for the consolidated reporting. The field is a free text field, so you can type any value. Be sure to type the values exactly the same on multi multiple dimensions if you want to roll up multiple dimension values during your consolidation. Next is the ability to calculate a total from multiple dimensions. This is a way to create a quote unquote placeholder in your dimension values that is used to roll up multiple dimensions. This is typically used for reporting and inquiry purposes. You can view and see these dimension values in a variety of places throughout the system, but it is important to note that the suspend checkbox is enabled automatically when you select this option to ensure that no transactions can post into the dimension value. Finally, is the option to require the dimension value to be balanced. This again is a mechanism to require the debits and credits to be equal on a transaction for the specific dimension value and is typically used by public sector organizations. You can translate the dis uh, now a few additional considerations for financial dimensions. You can translate the description of each financial dimension to another language. This is done on the fi financial dimensions value page and is only available for custom financial dimensions. In some cases, the source entity related to a financial dimension may support its own translations. This is for entity back dimensions. For example, items, for example, items. However, customer groups, for example, do not support translation on the values. External codes can be configured for each financial dimension as well. These codes are often used to make the values appear different on reports. For example, on a purchase order invoice or to integrate and map the value to another value in another system. 
Much like main accounts can have legal entity overrides, so can a financial dimension. This option is only available for custom dimensions and entity-backed dimensions where the data is not already legal entity specific. The options available for legal entity overrides include suspend, active from and to dates, and the owner field. It is important to note that you must activate a financial dimension before you can start using the dimension. While the individual values do not need to be activated, you will want to consider carefully your process for activating a dimension. It may make sense to configure all the values for the dimension prior to the activation. You will need to run the activation process during maintenance periods in your system since the addition of a financial dimension and the activation process makes schema changes to your system. Back to you, Rachel. Thanks, Eric. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about the defaulting behavior for financial dimensions. When you're deploying financial dimensions, one of the key considerations that you will want to make is how the dimensions will de be defined on your master data and transactions throughout the system. Depending on your business requirements, the Defaulting mechanisms available with Dynamics 365 Finance can si significantly improve or degrade the user experience when you're entering and processing transactions. There are several ways that defaulting can be configured in the system. So let's quickly review each. First is the ability to define values on master data like customers, vendors, and items. Next is the ability to define values on transactions like sales orders, purchase orders, and production orders. When you use an entity-backed financial dimension, many of the out-of-the-box dimensions support the ability to automatically copy the values to the dimension on the source data when it is created. You also have the ability to create financial dimension default templates. This feature allows you to define a combination of dimensions or even a breakdown of multiple combinations with a percentage to link to a source document header or line, such as a purchase order header or purchase order line. Next, you can define default dimensions on main accounts. This is useful when you're creating transactions directly in a journal entry, for example. It is important to note that this feature is a legal entity override, and you must specify the default for each legal entity, even if you only have one legal entity. Finally, is the ability to actually fix a dimension on a main account. This is done in the same screen that you define defaults. When you fix a dimension, a user can actually select a different value on a transaction or in a journal. And when the transaction is posted, the system will automatically make an adjusting entry, if it's required, to reclass the value to the fixed value. It's important to understand the basic flow of dimensions in your transactions when defining your dimensions and the defaulting configuration that makes the most sense for your business. So we've pulled together a basic list of rules and behavior that you will find generally throughout finance and operation apps that describe how dimensions flow through transactions. When you define a dimension on master data, like a customer, uh, for example, the dimensions will flow to the header of sales orders that you create for that customer. Next, when you start to create lines on an order, the dimensions on the header of the order will automatically flow to the lines of the order. But it's important to note that the line master data, such as a dimension defined on the item, will populate on the line of the order only if the dimension value is blank. So if it came from the header, the 
uh, dimension from the item would not get populated. Once you've created a transaction, the dimension from the header and lines of the transaction will flow into the posted source documents. In some cases, you can override the dimensions on a specific source document, such as the invoice, but we generally recommend that you specify these details on the original order and allow them to flow through the transaction. Finally, when a transaction is posted, such as a sales order invoice, the details are updated to the subledger and the ledger. For the example of the sales order, the customer subledger is updated with the customer details, the invoice amount, and the financial dimensions from the header of the order are copied to the customer transaction. However, the financial dimensions from the lines of the order are not copied to the customer transaction. Simultaneously, the inventory subledger is updated with the item, quantity, and the financial dimensions from the sales order line uh, when you post that transaction, and those are copied into the inventory transaction. Again, simultaneously, when you post that transaction, the ledger is updated with the summarized GL entry for the revenue, cost of goods sold, customer balance, and so on. The ledger is the only place that tracks the full financial dimension for the entry. It's important to note that if you're using a document that uses the source document framework, such as purchase orders, you can have distributed amounts on the header or the lines where you distribute the amounts to multiple financial dimensions. In this case, the general ledger voucher is the only place that the full dimension breakdown is available, and you won't see that breakdown of multiple dimensions at the header level in the customer transaction or at the line level in the inventory transaction uh, for those financial dimensions. <laughs> Now we're going to switch gears and take a look at a number of demonstrations. For our first demonstration, I'm going to hand it back over to Eric. Thank you, Rachel. This is a demonstration of default financial dimensions on master data. We'll be opening up the master data record, in this case, the uh, vendors, selecting a vendor, and moving to the financial dimensions fast tab where we will pick a value for the specific dimension, in this case, the cost center, and we'll save that value on the vendor that we chose. And this will allow this uh, that dimension to default when this vendor is used on a transaction. Back to you, Rachel. Sure. And I think we're going to show another one here uh, with the release product. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that's all right. Excuse me. <laughs> so, in this example, we've navigated into release products and selected a default dimension for the uh, item group. Um, so, a similar process is used on each of these different master data pages where you can. Uh, find that financial dimensions fast tab and specify those dimensions. For our next demonstration, we're going to take a look at defaulting or overriding financial dimensions on transactions. So in this example, again, I've gone into the uh, vendor page. So you can see dimensions are specified, which we did in the last demonstration, and I'm going to click to create a new purchase order. So I'm going to switch over to the header view on this purchase order and scroll down to the financial dimensions fast tab. Here you can see the dimensions that defaulted from the vendor. I'm actually overriding this cost center and changing it to a different cost center. You'll notice that the item group is also blank here. So now I'm going to switch back to the lines and I'll add an item to this order. I'll enter in the additional required details such as site, warehouse, and so on. And then I'm going to click down to line details and click on financial dimensions. So here you can see that it used the financial dimension from the header and it pulled in that item group financial dimension from the item. 
uh, which kind of connects with that last demonstration. So that's where you can see if you override the dimension on the header, it flows through to those lines. Um, on the left side of the screen here, we've got some other examples of how these dimensions will flow. So these dimensions that we've specified now will flow into packing slips and invoices for sales orders, for purchase orders, they'd flow into your product receipts and invoices. On a production order, <clears throat> excuse me, those dimensions would flow into your picking list and the report is finished and ending journals. And if you're using a project transaction, uh, those would flow into your project invoices, just as a, a few examples of how that works with the dimensions on your transactions flowing through to your posted transactions. Now back to Eric for our next demonstration. Thank you, Rachel. This is entity-backed defaulting of financial dimensions. So we're gonna open up a uh, master data in this case it's a project and we have or i'm sorry the project financial dimension and we have marked the copy values to this dimension on each new project created radio button we saved the financial dimension and now we are going to the all projects list page where we're going to create a new project and we're going to use the project um, that we um, updated the dimension for, the project value. And after the project is created, we'll go to the Financial Dimensions Fast tab, and we'll see that that project defaulted as a default financial dimension for the project that used the project value. Um, Thanks, Eric. Yep. Thank you. On the next demonstration, we're going to show you how to use financial dimension default templates on source documents. So we're going to start by taking a quick look at a financial dimension default template. I've already got one configured here for rent and utility costs, but you can create your own in this page by using the new icon and then clicking add on the distribution percentage. Next, I'm going to go in and create a uh, purchase order and show you how we can specify this on a purchase order. So I'm going to select a purchase order and I'm going to add a new line to this purchase order. This is the purchase order that we created earlier. In this example, I'm choosing the procurement category for rent. I'll enter in details such as quantity and price. And then I'm going to navigate down to the Financial Dimensions tab on the line details and select the template for the rent and utility cost. Now I'll scroll back up and click on the Financials button and select Distribute Amounts. This will open up a new page where you can see the system has automatically distributed this based on the percentages and financial dimension breakdown that we configured in that Financial Dimension default template. This will flow through to those various different purchase order lines and invoices. Similar functionality exists on free text invoices um, as well. Now we're going to hand it back over to Eric to talk about fixed financial dimensions. Thank you, Rachel. So a fixed financial dimension is configured on a main account. And so we're going to go to the chart of accounts. We're going to pick our chart of accounts which is the shared, and then we're going to select a main account to set up a fixed financial dimension. A fixed financial dimension or a default dimension, including fixed, are uh, legal entity specific override. So we're going to open up the legal entity override fast tab, click add to add our legal entity, and then click default dimension. And when we pick our dimension, in this case, business unit, we're going to set the type of default to fixed value. Then we're going to select the value. In this case, we're going to select 003 and we will save it. And now when you post to that main account, that dimension will be added at the end and overwrite everything that may have defaulted before that. Uh, next, Rachel is going to talk about derived financial dimensions. Thanks, Eric. 
So derived financial dimensions are configured directly on the financial dimensions page. So I'm going to pull up the uh, department here and click on derived dimensions and click add segment. So from the department dimension, when value 22 is selected, I want to derive business unit 001. And I'll add another row here for department 23 and select business unit 001. So now in this case, what I've configured when I uh, create a journal entry, if I select the department of 23 or 24, it's automatically going to select the business unit of 001 for me. So the example here was a department um, and it could be like another um, you know, sub department, uh, I did a business unit. It could be any of your dimensions and it doesn't have to be limited to just two segments. You can keep adding additional segments and you can also change the sequence of those segments. Um, there's also a checkbox on this page uh, called replace existing dimension values with derived values. When this checkbox is selected, it will actually override the values that were already previously selected on that um, journal entry or in those other financial dimensions um, in your segmented entry control. Uh, so there's a great uh, docs article that has a lot more detail on this. I encourage you to check that one out. So now I'm going to hand it back over to Eric, who is going to talk about some do's and don'ts, or actually, no, sorry, financial dimension sets uh, for um, our, our next topic. Eric? <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. We will be talking about do's and don'ts for financial dimension sets. As you, after you have configured the ledger, you will want to consider and configure your dimension sets. A dimension set is an ordered list of financial dimensions that is primarily used for reporting and inquiry purposes. The real uh, value of a dimension set is the balances for that dimension set. And those balances are derived from the general ed ledger data and stored in a format that optimizes for reporting and inquiry performance. The pattern for the dimension set balances to the general ledger data is very similar to the pattern for the financial reporting data mart and the general ledger data, meaning that the dimension set balances can be rebuilt from the general ledger data, but they're an optimized version of the same data. Because you can define your own financial dimensions, you must define which combinations of financial dimensions you want to calculate and report on. At a minimum, you must create one dimension set that includes only the main account. Additional dimension sets should be considered carefully based on your reporting and inquiry needs because a dimension set with balances has an impact on system performance. This means you don't have to delete a dimension set you no longer need, and it's fine to just clear the balances. Consider that just three financial dimensions can be used to create 15 unique dimension sets. Three dimension sets with one dimension, six dimension sets with two dimensions, and six dimension sets with three dimensions. For example, it is reasonable to create the balances for a dimension set that you only use occasionally, such as during year-end processing, right before you need them, say the week that you're going to do the year-end closing, and then clear the balances when you are done in a week or two after the year-end close is complete. That way, you can use the balances from that dimension set, but they don't affect you the rest of the year when you don't need them. So you can leave the dimension set, but just clear the balances. And here we have a demonstration of how to create or configure a dimension set. So you open up the financial dimension sets page. Um, you click new and you enter a unique ID for the financial dimension set and then give it a descriptive name. And you can see the demo data uses uh, 
dimension set names that have uh, which dimensions they include. The available financial dimensions on the left can be selected and inserted into the selected dimensions. And then because of a dimension set is an ordered list, you can use in the selected dimensions, the financial dimensions, you can use the up and down arrows to order them how you want and make it a unique ordering. After you've saved the financial dimension, you can click to create balances, which runs a batch job to summarize the general ledger data into the balance, or I'm sorry, into the dimension set format. You can also use the update balances button to schedule a refresh for the balances, which will include general ledger data that has been posted since the last update. So an update is an incremental thing and you can schedule a, a update balances batch job to refresh it at some interval, which we'll talk about more in a few minutes. So where are dimension sets used? So the, the trial balance page is the number one or the poster child or uh, the perfect example of the financial dimension set balances. It's where they're used the most. They're also used in the financial reporting, Power BI financial reports, and the dimension statement report. If you enjoy our meme, we would really appreciate a little emoji or a thumbs up in the Q&A panel over on the right, because finance is fun too. Yes, and if you're on the Windows platform, you can use the window key and the period to open up the emoji uh, list. I learned that yesterday, and uh, I was like mind blown about the Windows dot feature. It was amazing. And we have more of those more fun planned in later parts of this series. So, but let's get back to how you how you manage your dimension sets. It is important that when you create a new dimension set, you only use the create balances button to initialize the balance if or when you intend to use the balances. When a dimension set has balances, the balances must be updated after any posting to the general ledger. The system will update the balances before they is, are used, such as when the user clicks calculate on the trial balance list page. You may have seen this, the dialogue that comes up for updating the balances, but our goal is to make that uh, quick. If there have been a lot of postings to the general ledger since the last time the balances were updated, updating the balances could take some time. For example, the first person to view the trial balance in the morning will have to wait for all the nightly posting to be added to the balances, which could be significant. To avoid users having to wait for a large balance update, schedule a recurring balance update using the Update Balances button. This will ensure that any balance updates triggered by a user are small and complete quickly. When scheduling a recurring balance update, there are two factors to consider. First is how often each dimension set's balances are used for reporting. Second is how much posting to General Ledger is being done. For example, if a large amount of posting to the General Ledger is done at night, you could schedule the recurring balance update to be done after the posting is complete and before the users get to work in the morning. Another example is if your company does a lot of posting during the day, schedule a recurring balance update once an hour to make sure that the balance update a user would have to wait for is never too large. And if it's a dimension set that is just not used very often, that's when we would recommend that you just clear the balances and leave it, you know, and take that off the system, that burden off the system. Don't schedule a recurring 
balance rebuild. Now, this is a rebuild, not an update. As a rebuild should be unnecessary and will, and doing it, scheduling one will, or a recurring rebuild will cause performance issues, especially if the recurrence is on a high frequency, such as in minutes. Rebuilding the balances of a dimension set is similar to resetting the data mart in financial reporting. And that should not be necessary often, if at all. We recommend that you rebuild the balances using the rebuild balances button only when the balances are sus suspected to be inaccurate. In general, you should not need to use re the rebuild balances function. And if you do, this is an indication of a larger issue and you should open a support ticket for further inve investigation into the reason the balances are not accurate because it's likely a bug of some sort. You should never schedule a recurring balance rebuild as this will cause performance issues. And again, if you no longer need the balances for a dimension set, you should use the clear balances button to delete them and stop the impact during posting to the general ledger. You can create the balances again at any time when they are needed. Now, a little bit of troubleshooting for dimension sets. If you are facing performance issues with your dimension sets, there are several troubleshooting techniques that you can try to improve the performance. First is to reduce the frequency of the update balance jobs if the recurring schedule is too aggressive so they don't conflict with users accessing the reports as frequently. On the other hand, if users are having to wait too long for the balance updates, consider increasing the frequency of the recurring balance update or fine tune it to be more strategic on a per customer basis. The year end close and consolidation will schedule a full rebuild of the balances for all dimension sets that are tracking balances. They, it does not schedule anything if the balances have been cleared. A rebuild is required because the dimension set balance design does not support deleting the general ledger data since that is a rare event. But consolidation and year and close are the two examples that do delete general ledger data. Here are some tips when those dimension set balance rebuilds are required. Do not schedule batch jobs to rebuild balances while those processes are running on any company because they will conflict with each other. Enable the feature to improve the performance of a balance rebuild. This works by rebuilding a specific date range instead of everything in the GL. For example, for a consolidation, if you're only consolidating one month, rebuilding the balances for that month will be much easier than rebuilding the entire general ledger data. The consolidation dialog has an option to skip the balance set rebuild, which can be used to save time in a test environment, but you should not use it in production. And for production, you could consider just clearing the balance while you're running the consolidation or year end close, because then they would not have to be rebuilt, especially if you may run the consolidation or year end close multiple times. And by clearing the balance, you'll let the users know that you cannot use that dimension set for a little while, and when you're done, you can uh, initialize the balances or create the balances again. Now, Rachel is going to talk about some do's and don'ts for financial dimensions. Rachel, you're on mute. That's a feature. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk a little bit about do's and don'ts for the financial dimensions. Uh, some things that you want to make sure that you're doing. You want to make sure that you are running the financial dimension activation process during maintenance hours. Remember, it does make schema changes. Uh, we also recommend that you use caution when defaulting the same dimension on multiple types of master data. In general, dimensions are only going to be added or filled in 
if the dimension value is already blank. So if it was already specified on the customer and you also put it on the item, uh, the customer dimension would win. Use financial dimensions when financial uh, statements need to be segmented. So, you know, the kind of converse of this is the, you know, don't use financial dimensions when the subledger can be used for reporting. We talked about this a little bit in part one, but I want to reemphasize this, right, because uh, you shouldn't be using a project dimension as an example, as a way to basically not implement the project's module um, and trying to kind of build all of this logic into a financial dimension. Um, that's generally not a, uh, a good scenario. We also encourage you and recommend that you create dimension values that are reusable. Some things to make sure that you're not doing. Um, make sure that when you create a new financial dimension, that you create and activate those financial dimensions um, in a test environment uh, first before you start creating them in production. There's likely other configurations and downstream posting profiles and things like that that need to be updated as well. And you should be testing those things uh, to make sure that you've got everything right um, and you've got a good cutover process when you're making these kinds of changes. We also don't recommend that you use a single dimension for multiple purposes. So um, if you've got a cost center dimension and on your revenue accounts, it represents a brand and on your expense accounts, it represents departments we wouldn't recommend that you try to combine those together. Instead, we recommend that you create two separate dimensions and use your account structures to say that revenue accounts have brands and expense accounts have departments. Um, and we already talked about this uh, use financial dimensions. Don't use financial dimensions when a subledger can be used for reporting. Um, and the last one here is don't create dimension values that are used once or a few times, right? Another way to think of this is don't create degenerate dimensions. Uh, these are dimensions with values that aren't reusable, such as the sales order number or a purchase order number. This causes big performance issues um, around the dimension sets and therefore affects uh, reporting, the year in close process and consolidation. Uh, but it can also affect your transaction entry since there are a huge number of dimension attribute value combination records that are created. So now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about some do's and don'ts for your dimension sets. Some things to make sure that you're doing. Do define dimension sets according to your reporting needs. Um, do make sure that you're running those updates periodically. Obviously the frequency that you need to update those dimension sets are gonna be based on your business requirements, the frequency that you need to use them, uh, the types of reports that you're running with those dimension sets. We also recommend that you clear the balances for unused dimension sets, remembering that you can always um, if you clear the balances, you don't need to delete it. You can then reinitialize those balances when you're ready to start using that dimension set again. We also recommend that you rebuild balances only on an as needed basis. You should not be running those rebuilds regularly. We also don't recommend uh, running consolidations or the year end close process while updating your dimension set balances. And then don't create too many dimension sets with balances. Less is generally better. Remember that reports and processes will get slower for each dimension set that is created and activated or initialized. So year in close and consolidations will all be slower. Your reporting will also be impacted. So we are going to wrap up today with our checklist. This is the same checklist that we shared in part one. Uh, so nothing new here, but, um, you know, we do encourage you to, um, 
you know, use this checklist as a reference. It will be available with the PowerPoint along with the recording on the Tech Talks Dynamics uh, community page. Um, and it is a, a two-page checklist. We couldn't fit it all on one page. So uh, use this as a great reference to kind of help you through that process. Uh, we're about, you know, halfway through that checklist now in terms of the things that we've talked about and covered in parts one and two. Um, and we'll be taking a look at a, a lot of these other setups and configurations in parts three through five of our Tech Talk series. We have also pulled together, um, you know, there's resources for you, a link here to the General Ledger Docs, um, which recently had a reorganization. And uh, we also have the uh, Finance Learning Catalog. Uh, so with that, we are going to open it up for questions. I know we've had a number of great questions come through um, already that we've answered in the chat, um, and we've got a couple that are, are still open. Um, uh, yeah, Rachel, I'm going to read this one and ask you to ask you to answer it, please. I know you talked about this, but I had I had this requirement several times for very good re for very good reasons. How do you allow dimensions on, for example, items to default to the sales order line, even though the dimensions on the sales order header are different? In other words, the dimensions on the header should, in some cases, not default to the lines. The item dimension should default instead. I've configured this in AX2012, but don't know if it's possible in Dynamics 365 Finance and Operations. It yeah, in in Dynamics 365 FNO, right? This example here, you would have to do an extension um, to to kind of tell the system to override those dimensions. So the logic that we use is we will only go pull those dimensions in if they are blank. So if it's filled in on the header, I'm going to pull it to the line automatically, and I'm not going to go check and see if there is a dimension on the item, but Right. The thing I would challenge you on here is, are we trying to multi-purpose a dimension and should it really be two different dimensions and one is specified on the customer and one is specified on the item? Obviously, without knowing the business requirements and kind of what those reasons are, it's hard to say. Um, but, you know, if if you want to change that defaulting logic and kind of the sequence that it happens on a sales order line, for example, you would need to extend uh, that sales order line. Um, it's pr I, I don't know exactly what method it's in, but I'm kind of guessing that it would be in the init from method for the released product. Yeah, and I was going to say that you could probably, there's probably two approaches you could use there. You could either over or do your customization on the defaulting to the line when the item is entered, or you could do your customization when the header dimensions are defaulted and not default them from the header if in the condition where you want the where you want the item to kick in. Because if it's not mm -hmm. there, then the natural defaulting, but one or the other would be required. Um, we had another question in the uh, chat about the difference between rebuild and update balances on the dimension set. So I'll just cover that quickly. The uh, A rebuild deletes all the dimension set balances and recreates them from the general ledger data from the beginning of the general ledger for all of the general ledger. So it's generally a pretty heavy process, whereas an update only adds the uh, what has been posted to the general ledger since the last update or since the last rebuild. So if you rebuild it and then you post one one uh, journal entry, then the update will only have to include that one journal entry. So that is the 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 difference between the two uh, between an update and a rebuild on the dimension sets. Uh, the other question, I'm sorry, another question is, is there a security role linked to defining the financial dimension sets? Um, there is a role for it. Um, I would have to look up uh, what the role, what roles are allowed access to the dimension set form. But I think in general, you either have access to the form or you do not. Yeah, you know, and, and a quick tip for figuring that out. Um, if you open up any page in the, the software and you go over to the options tab in the action pane, 
there is a button there called security diagnostics. So if you go into the financial dimension sets page and click on that security diagnostics button, uh, it'll open up a new pane on the right hand side and you'll be able to see which roles, duties and privileges have access to that. And obviously, if you don't like the out of the box roles, duties and privileges, you can always create your own um, as well to meet those requirements. But, you know, to that point, we talked about it a lot in part one, right, the whole governance process around this. Um, you know, definitely all of your financial dimensions and, and not just the main account should be included in that governance process and uh, be part of your security configurations and considerations when you're implementing. Um, and I have a question that I, we haven't seen only a few uh, likes or dislikes for the uh, the poster child meme. So please let us know if you if you enjoyed that or not. Oh, there was a ton of them. I published them all, Eric. Ah, I see. Okay, great. Great. <laughs> yeah. And then people started thumbs upping them. So, uh, oh, there they are. You know, wonderful. Yeah, they're, they're all over there. So, thank you. Um, we're we're glad that you liked our our joke, our finance joke. We've we've got a couple more up our sleeves in the upcoming parts. Uh, we've we've compiled a, a really great GIF. Um, and and some other uh, some funny memes. So yeah, here, we hope you'll join us. Yeah, here's a question that was in the chat before, and I I mentioned we'd answer it. Here is related to what's the right number or the restrictions on the number of financial dimensions, and there are some hard limits around ten, where some things are not as supported beyond ten financial dimensions, and then financial dimension values, and I'll the limits on the number of values and. I'll let uh, Rachel take that one. So um, a, a couple of things here, right? So the limit on the number of financial dimensions, um, th technically there is no limit, right? But just because you can does not mean you should. So our general recommendation is that somewhere in the neighborhood of three to six financial dimensions is about n normal and um, reasonable. Um, the and we'll talk about this more in the account structure and advanced rules session which is part three happening next week but um if you have more than 10 you will be forced to use advanced rules and it's very common in the public sector to have this but um i still like firmly and this is just my personal opinion that i, I think sometimes we're trying to solve problems in the general ledger um, that likely could be solved in one of the subledgers. Um, so there's not a hard limit, but I, I would generally say six is good. When you start having this many dimensions, you really need to focus in on usability. Now, from the number of values in a financial dimension, again, there's no technical limit to how many values you could have in a financial dimension. Um, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, so again, when we're thinking about those number of values and you're thinking about your dimension sets and the performance of the system, if you have a financial dimension with millions of values, I question mark if that's a degenerate dimension and how many times is that dimension value going to be used? If that dimension value is only going to be used two or three times at, you know, and therefore that combination is like really unique, that's kind of outside of what we consider to be best practices. Um, so, and, and again, right, I oftentimes ask, like, are we trying to do something in the general ledger that can really be done in the sub ledger? Um, I, and I always kind of go back to the, do I need to print an income statement by this value? Uh, and if the answer to that question is no, then it likely doesn't belong in your general ledger. And I don't want to say that that's a hard and fast rule, but that's, you know, if you're looking to like challenge your customer or to like figure out, does this really belong here? Um, you know, always ask the, what are you going to use this for? How do you report on this? When do you report on this? And figure out if there's a better way from a subletter standpoint to achieve 
that requirement rather than putting that many dimension values in your chart of accounts. Um, Cause I think it's always going to be not great. Yeah. And the, the values kind of comes down to reuse. Uh, we mentioned it in this presentation a, a bit briefly, but the fact is that creating a combination is quite expensive. Um, more than just the dimension attribute value combination, there are, you know, a, a, a good old fashioned combination with maybe five dimensions probably creates about 25 records in the system in different tables. And so it's super cheap to reuse it. So, which is why we mentioned if you create a combination and you only use it once, then that's going to be a real problem because not surprisingly, the fin a financial dimension set is a different combination. Ba it's based on the original, but it's a different combination. So it ends up having to create a combination. Year end close when you do, uh, when you do things with dimensions like collapsing or not collapsing also creates new combinations. Same thing with consolidations. So those combinations are what, and the reuse around them is what really determines uh, system performance. Um, and so even if it's not degenerate, if you're only, if you create the combination and really only use a con combination once or twice in the GL, then that's not a great pattern, uh, just from a performance perspective. And like Rachel said, there's probably some usability or something around it. And at, at a dimension set level, if you run a trial balance for a dimension set and you have a million rows in the, in the trial balance, it's not really usable anyway. So that's why you want to, you know, be, be thoughtful about, uh, starting with the value, the number of dimensions, the number of values, and what is in your, what your dimension sets, how they're defined. Yeah. So we got a couple more that came in. What do you mean by translated dimension? Um, so it's a language translation. So if you have the need to uh, print financial statements in two languages, let's say you need English and you need French, you and you've got a global chart of accounts, you could, um, you know, everything's set up in English, and then uh, you can translate the values to French. So instead of the English, you know, text for the description of your dimension, you could translate that to French or Spanish or German or some other language. Translations only support translating the text, the description, or the name. Um, and I think that question actually had a second part to it. Um, so it was more like a comment. So the Contoso data has a lot of dimensions. How realistic is that setup? So, and Eric, I see you typing in. Yeah. It's not realistic. Um, you know, the Contoso demo data is, it's got a lot of different countries and it's there to like be able to demonstrate a lot of different features. Um, and that, that setup is not realistic, um, at all. Um, one, yeah. One of the first things I do when I deploy a new demo data environment is go clear the balances on 30 dimension sets. <laughs> so, and then I put the face palm in there because it's a terrible experience. If you run a, if you run a year end close or something on demo data, all those dimension sets will completely dominate the time the year end close takes. Yeah. And then, uh, time for one last question. Um, how do people use the dimension hierarchy for reporting purposes? Um, so great question. Um, and I'm assuming that you're talking about the organization hierarchy. Um, and we're actually going to be covering that in part three. So, um, hopefully you'll join us back next week and we'll be diving into that organization hierarchy and how to use it with your account structures and reporting. So with that, I think we're going to hand it back over to, uh, Peggy to wrap us up and do our survey today. Thanks everyone for joining. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much, Eric. So if the audience could have a quick look in the live event Q&A panel, I have posted a link to a short survey. We'd love your feedback on today's session and hear what you'd like to see in future events. So please take a moment to fill that out and thank you so much. 
Um, and as a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days, and all attendees will receive an email notification once that's available. So again, a big thank you to Eric and Rachel and our audience for joining. Have a great day or evening wherever you are.